Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Looking into the Great Pyramid of Egypt is a study like no other. You soon realise there are many misconceptions, false claims and major errors that get repeated until they have almost become facts. And this means that many researchers are actually using these false claims to build hypotheses that, at their very core, have no scientific or historical truth. Some researchers put forward Herodotus as the father of history and that he was a credible source of information and truth, yet discount his claims that Khufu, Khafre and Menkore built the Giza pyramids with the help of wooden machines, as it says so clearly in his works. Therefore, is Herodotus a reliable source, or one we should take with a pinch of salt? Maybe it's a bit of both, but there are many reasons to question his reliability as a source. The Great Pyramid is the grandest structure of ancient Egypt, a monument that has lasted thousands of years, yet the civilization, technology and the language of the pyramid builders has disappeared, and we are left to piece together a history that will always be incomplete and full of inconsistencies. When we study the pyramids, we do have to start at the basics, look at what we can analyse scientifically and what we can measure. For example, the four sides are roughly the same length, varying by just 20 centimetres. The sides are oriented to the cardinal directions, each sloping just over 51 degrees. It is estimated that around 2.3 million limestone blocks were used in its construction, each with an average weight of 2.5 tonnes. As we can see, the casing stone is now missing, except for a few stones towards the base. But Herodotus described it by saying, It is built by stones smoothed and fitted together in the most perfect manner, not one of the stones being less than 30 feet in length. This casing stone was taken away by the Arabs after they conquered Egypt in 820 AD, and they used it to build modern day Cairo. The casing was apparently covered in hieroglyphic graffiti, and only a few blocks of the first step survive today. Inside there haven't been many discoveries since the opening by the Caliph al mamun in the 9th century. Only the so-called air shafts and relieving chambers above the King's Chamber were found since, as well as the large void above the Grand Gallery that was found in 2017, but this is still yet to be confirmed by exploration. But there is so much more we can learn about the pyramids, thanks to geologist Frank Zalewski and his team, who took 12 samples of limestone from the lower two courses of the Great Pyramid, including casing stone and core masonry. Their locations are shown on the screen now. The team also analysed rock samples from all of the quarries, natural openings and outcrops on the Giza Plateau, and produced their findings in a fantastic paper titled Petrographic Observations of the Building Stones of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Zalewski was trying to determine the mineral petrographic composition of the pyramid limestone blocks, to make a more complete picture of what stone was used to make the structure and where it was sourced. On top of this, he and his team also made a great number of visual observations from different angles with different lighting at different times of the day, to see if they could see any unusual patterns that might allude to just how the structure was built. The in-depth results of the mineral compositions of the samples are best read in the scientific paper, which I will link below in the description. But the conclusions of the study are most interesting. It showed that the Great Pyramid is built with at least three different types of limestone. The first is a micrite sparite limestone with remains of crustacean fossils. This is known as a wacky stone. The second is a micrite sparite limestone with a parallel texture, which is best classified as the type of mudstone. The third is an organodendritic limestone with fragments of crushed mollusk shells and is called a grainstone. Where these were used in the pyramid, I will come to shortly. The interesting thing to take away from this is that the limestone from the quarries, natural exposures and outcrops of the Giza Plateau are not discovered anywhere in the Great Pyramid construction. It is therefore a geological fact that the quarries that Egyptologists tell us were worked for the pyramid building stone were not used for the Great Pyramid. 
Limestone from the Giza Plateau is strongly dolomitized, and no dolomitized limestone is found on the Great Pyramid. This paper by Frank Zalewski therefore rewrites the narrative we are told. Interestingly, this idea was actually put forward by prominent Egyptologist W. M. F. Petri in 1883 when he said, Limestone from the Western Hills differs in the mineral composition from the limestone in the pyramid complex. The last one is more similar to the limestone of the eastern bank of the Nile River. Thus, we can assume that all this material was extracted from the steep cliffs of Chura and Madi. From this place, it was transported to the building site. It's interesting that Petri assumed this was the case, and even wrote that the Giza quarries were not used for the pyramids more than 130 years ago. Yet modern textbooks seem to have written their own history, which we now know is false. We don't know for sure that the Great Pyramid Building Stone originated from Madi or Chura, but if this is the most likely origin, it means that every one of the 2.3 million stones of the Great Pyramid would have had to have been brought across the River Nile, which is no easy task. But everything that I've mentioned so far pales in comparison to what Zalewski also discovered. The three different types of limestone mentioned are not arranged randomly on the Great Pyramid. The first type was used for the majority of the pyramid's core masonry, the second finer limestone was to cover or case the pyramid, and the third was found to be arranged in a very specific way and that they formed large triangular formations on the lower courses of each of the four faces of the pyramid. These blocks are also the best preserved compared to the other pyramid stone and they have an apex ending on the 19th course on each of the four sides. These triangles were therefore not placed by accident. Furthermore, these triangles are not just seen by analysing the rock types, they are clearly visible when you know what you're looking for. They are also lighter in colour and compared to the rest of the pyramid, they are precisely fitted together into this triangular form. In the northern face of the pyramid, the apex of the triangle was damaged during the opening of the original entrance. In this photograph, we can see the position of the original entrance in relation to the north face triangle formation. It is precisely at the apex in the 19th layer of stone. In the southern and eastern walls, you can also trace the triangles, but the apex of each is not so clear. Could these have been decoys to stop people finding the true entrance? But is there actually a concealed entrance in each of the four sides of the pyramid? Interestingly, the ancient Greek geographer Strabo, writing in his book Geography, says that, high up, approximately midway between the sides, it has a movable stone, and when this is raised up, there is a sloping passage to the vault. We assume he is referring to the entrance to the descending passageway on the north side of the pyramid, but we cannot know this for sure. The Caliph al Mamun never discovered such a movable stone after the casing was all removed in the 9th century. But for all we know, there could have been a movable stone on each of the four faces of the pyramid. It's just that now we know where to look on the 19th course. The most visible Great Pyramid Triangle is the one I have not yet mentioned on the western face of the pyramid. It is topped with a single large stone on the 19th course. Compared to the southern and eastern face, the triangular apex is clear to see. Maybe due to its prominence, this block is actually Strabo's movable stone. Over in Dashur, the Bent Pyramid, thought to be a precursor to the Great Pyramid, has two entrances. One on the north face like the Great Pyramid, which leads to a system of corridors and chambers, and a second entrance on the western face. The second entrance has a separate system of corridors, which many believe were never connected to those in the north. Therefore, the Great Pyramid may well have had a similar set of internal chambers. It is the belief of the author of the paper, Frank Zalewski, that on the western face of the Great Pyramid, behind the stone that marks the apex of the triangle on the 19th course, there is in fact a second concealed entrance into the Great Pyramid. Moving just one block is probably all we need to do to confirm this. This in itself would be a revelation, but why build these triangles into the pyramid in the first place? 
and why use a specific type of stone and also put more care into laying them into place compared to the rest of the pyramid. I believe that these blocks, a different stone to the rest of the pyramid, best preserved and arranged into triangular features on each face, may actually be later additions to cover up the entrance or entrances into the Great Pyramid. These blocks are better preserved simply because they were added later to close it up. Also, looking at the north face, the archway over the entrance looks well finished and to me doesn't look like it was made to be covered over with masonry as it once was. I think the archway is a primary external feature of the pyramid whilst the masonry that covers it is secondary. I suspect that originally there was a true grand entrance of the northern face and maybe there are even steps concealed within the masonry, concealed when the pyramid's original function went out of use. Maybe if we could peel away the stones of the triangular formation, we could see the original pyramid structure and not what I believe is a renovated version we see today. The evidence suggests that there could be more than one entrance into the pyramid, but also that the lower part of each of the four faces was renovated in antiquity, and once looked very different to how we see it today. According to Herodotus, as Pharaoh, Khufu closed all the temples, forbade sacrificial offerings, and forced people to work for him so that he could build the Great Pyramid. Maybe to an extent Herodotus was right, but maybe he didn't build it from the ground up, but he closed it up as he did the temples, added the triangular structures on each side to turn it into a true pyramid and then cased it in white Chura limestone, which in itself is a huge project. Herodotus says that Khufu built an underground sebulchre within the pyramid and that a tributary of the river Nile flowed into the structure. He says that water flowed around an island on which the king was buried. This of course has never been discovered inside the pyramid, but maybe the entrance to Khufu's tomb is actually accessed through the western face of the Great Pyramid. Maybe the Great Pyramid is Khufu's tomb, a structure out of use for millennia that he transformed to be his final resting place. Moving just one block on the pyramid's western side may finally reveal the true secrets of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.